Few weapons on the 21st century battlefield are as effective as the modern sniper. On any battlefield, a proficient sniper has got the capability to change the tide of that battle. Now fielded by every branch of the U.S. Armed Forces, from the Army to the Marines, Coast Guard, and Navy, these elite warriors continue to prove their value in modern conflicts. No shot is the same shot, so you have to be prepared for every shot. This four-part series looks at how the role of the sniper, their tactics and technology, are changing to effectively combat everything from insurgents to smugglers and tribal warlords. You can't just stamp out a sniper. These professionals are highly trained, infinitely adaptable, and frighteningly lethal. They are today's modern sniper. I'm Sean Parker. I'm the team leader of Sniper Team 1, Viper 1. I'm going to go ahead and orient you guys this morning for our mission. The final exercise of the Sniper Team Leader course demonstrates the improved skills and tactics of the advanced modern sniper. I'm with 1 6, and I'm tasked with uh, bringing stability back to the, the area. Give me your mission in a, in a, in a one, one sentence blurb. Insert, get eyes on objective. Get all my men back safely to the extract point and give the commander as much information we can on the objective for his attack as possible. The advanced sniper has grown from the two-man team with a single objective to a six-man element capable of taking on increasingly complex missions. The insurgents did occupy in that area. Took over the locals, harassing the locals with uh, small arms fire, improvised explosive devices. They've been attacking the police stations. In addition to increased team numbers, what separates the advanced sniper is his expert camouflage capability, the ability to call in close air support, and most importantly, his ability to think on his feet. You gotta be an, an adaptive, intuitive thinker. And with a growing demand for sniper teams, the Army, Marines, Navy, and even police snipers have come together to take a course that over the next eight weeks will teach them the combat capabilities and explosive power of the advanced sniper team. A sniper team leader needs to be well versed, not just in marksmanship or even observation, but in other areas that you know, are gonna allow him to be able to do his job better. Take a knee, belay out, engage targets. They're gaining the knowledge on how to engage targets at an angle, the calculations that go into that. The other thing they're, they're taking away from this is the understanding of how to employ demolitions. It's not covered in the basic course, it is covered here. What makes the advanced sniper unique is their understanding of the sniper team and how to lead it. The most important thing is the ability to lead a mission, be able to tactically decide, communicate, and execute a mission to uh, the fullest. It's fundamental here because as a team leader and uh, both in Iraq and Afghanistan that's what you're going to be doing. He is no longer a lone warrior tasked with a single shot. He is part of a team whose skill sets and tactics are so varied and advanced that they can alter the landscape of the battlefield. The sniper team did not come from any particular service. It is a shared tactic that has been adapted to suit the needs of the modern sniper. And although each different branch of the military trains at separate facilities with varying courses, they must ultimately work together seamlessly to accomplish the overall mission. You'll have air support from Marines, you'll have EOD support from the Navy, you'll have Army support for your QRF, so just a big joint operation. Working with the other branches, it helps you you know, get everyone's different views on sniper missions and different ways to do things. I think every service, they, they pretty much do about the same things. Just some might shoot a little bit better than others. Some might be better at tactics than the others. This sharing of information between services has helped to create the advanced sniper. They are part of a team. Each member of that team brings unique skills that make the sniper more effective. How a sniper team is formed is dependent on that branch of the military. For the Coast Guard, a sniper team is a gunner, a pilot, and a co-pilot.
For the Marines, a sniper team can be a six-man unit, and for the Army, a sniper team may only be three soldiers taking on a particular mission. There are three basic positions of the advanced sniper team. The team leader is most often the primary sniper of the team. He is carrying the long-range bolt-action rifle capable of hitting a high-value target past 1,000 yards. We're here, Camp Geiger. We're going to uh, depart Camp Geiger with Team 1, Viper 1. Not necessarily the guy always pulling the trigger. Uh, anyone in the team could be up actually observing in country and be the one to have to initiate an ambush or engage a threat. But your team leader is going to be the most seasoned guy on the team, not necessarily senior in rank, but most experienced in the team. He's going out with his team all the time. When his team is on the ground, he's there. It's his responsibility. He's the one calling the shots out there. When we go out there, it's going to be me and four other guys. And we're going to be, you know, operating in that area and doing whatever we have to do without immediate supervision from anybody. The first job of the team leader is to assemble snipers with various weapons and capabilities to support him. The first position to be filled is the assistant team leader. Your ATL, your assistant team leader, he's, his main responsibility is going to be the uh, strong arm of the team. He's going to be ensuring that team training is always being conducted when you're back in the rear and when you're in country that uh, the state of readiness of the team is always high. All right, from here, I can go off the small of his back. The assistant team leader usually carries another long-range weapon, but his weapon is meant for rapid, closer engagements. He is a defensive weapon who will defend his team from multiple enemies at varying distances. With the team leader, the ATL helps to assign the other positions on the sniper team. It's all about experience, and who's fit for the job, and who's going to increase survivability for the team when they're out on the battlefield. The third and fourth members of the team account for what's possibly the most vital element to its survival and safety, security. The security is preferably a two-man element carrying tremendous firepower. The best tool for the security is a fully automatic weapon capable of repelling a full-scale close-in attack. Uh, when it comes to security element, the security element will end up overwatching the areas that you can't watch because you're observing. It could be uh, to wherever the main funnel is to come into your area. Uh, it could be top of a stairwell that you can still see that soldier from your uh, loophole or wherever your hide is that you've got. You can still see them, uh, and they've got their eyes focused just on that door. It's their only job. They can see out from their own loophole or whatever out to the area approaching it. While a three- or four-man team is the base for the advanced sniper, both the Marines and Army would prefer the safety and skill set of a six-man team. The fifth member of the team is the RTO, or radio telephone operator. If you're lucky enough to get a guy that his actual MOS is out of calm, or if you have to spin one of your own guys up that's a uh, basic rifleman and turn him into your communicator. Hunter 2-2, two -two, Hunter 2-2, two -two, this is Viper 6. The sixth and final member of the team is the point man. He brings another skill set to the team that they might need on that mission. He can also become a second sniper or third security member. He fills any need the team might have. So that's your basic breakdown of a six-man team. Over the next eight weeks, the Sniper Leader Course will teach these newly formed teams what it takes to be an advanced sniper. Like building blocks, they will add to their expertise with camouflage, high-angle shooting, demolitions, and calling for fire support. A six-man element out on the battlefield as a sniper team can change the course of any area. And at the end of the course, the sniper teams will have to call on all their advanced tactics to take on a final exercise, where they will have to be both the hunter and the hunted. Coming up on Modern Sniper. You need a gun that's quick to get in the fight. The unconventional weapons and gear of the sniper team. And you better believe that they're going to be gunning for you because they want to get you out of the fight faster than anybody. And later, the final exercise. On today's battlefield, an accurate long-range rifle is no longer the only weapon keeping the sniper team safe. The sniper team leader course teaches the advanced sniper to think beyond a single bullet. 
They must look at weapons with rapid engagement capabilities and massive destructive power. While each member of the team has a weapon specific to his role, he must also be capable of defending himself in a firefight. To do this, the Marines and Army run the advanced sniper teams through scenarios where they must fall back on the standard issue M4 carbine. Uh, it's easy to manipulate and you can get a lot of rounds down range on the target if need be. And with a bolt gun, if you've got everybody carrying their precision rifles and you're to insert and take contact, it's going to be really, really hard to get that uh, fire superiority and be able to break contact away from the enemy with, with just bolt guns because you just can't lay down the type of fire that you need with that weapon system. It's easier uh, when you're going into buildings, clearing a building, uh, occupying a building. That's when I'd say it's easier. You know? You got more bullets you can hold and you can, you know, it's lighter, you can fire that sucker faster. Carrying an M4 through the city, uh, Vice having uh, a Mark 11, say, as your primary. Mark 11 has a tendency to jam, uh, sometimes, you know, not cared for properly, whereas the the M4 is a little bit more reliable and it packs a little bit more fire, uh, more firepower. You have a bigger magazine capacity, uh, so you can, you know, engage a little bit longer before you have to reload. And for a sniper, the M4 has another use. Carrying the M4 allows the sniper team to blend in with line infantry troops. Oh, it blends in with everybody else that's in sector. Everybody else has one. You go out there with your M14. Wait a minute, why is that guy got an M14? The enemy that we're currently fighting, uh, they'd be happy to go home just knowing that they killed one, uh, a service member. But when you start talking about specialized troops, that takes a lot longer and a lot more money to train. Um, and the experience level that that troop might have and the psychological factor he might have had against your troops. If you're picked out to be that specialized troop, then you better believe that they're going to be gunning for you because they want to get you out of the fight faster than anybody. In order to give their team additional firepower, the team leader will equip every M4 with an M203 grenade launcher. The M203 grenade launcher greatly increases a sniper team's firepower. We employed it effectively uh, in Iraq. Its main job, there's a, there's a lot more to it than people employ it for. If we were, were compromised, that would be a perfect weapon to be able to use because it hits our dead space. It goes, it, you can hit around a corner with it. You know, uh, you shoot past the corner. Obviously, you're going to hit what's on the other side of it. If you were shooting single rounds out of your M4 or a bolt gun back at them, then they'll sit there and they'll hang in it. They'll stay there and they'll shoot and shoot and. It won't be fun, but if you start laying down machine gun fire, start shooting two or threes at them, and there's stuff blowing up at them, they're, you know, there's, their buddies are getting blown up, then they're going to run away. In addition to the M203, a sniper team member will carry numerous hand grenades. It's actually one of the best, better weapons that we have. So distance-wise, you throw grenades down range keeps the enemy away from you. Sniper team leaders and sniper teams have many different grenades that they're bringing out on missions with them. Smoke grenades, for example, mainly used to create a screen, allowing you to disappear out of the area. You might then also need to use smoke to, say, mark a, an LZ. You're wanting them to be positioned in this location. So you might use smoke to mark the direction that you want them to come from. Your direction of approach is going to be marked by smoke. You're not going to tell them the color because you want them to read that back to you as, as a type of positive link up. Your position be marked by smoke. Roger, I tally your green smoke. But weapons aren't the only new technology the advanced sniper is learning. The sniper team leader course highlights the difference between snipers of the past and the advanced snipers of today. As computers become commonplace on the front lines of today's battlefield, the advanced sniper has greater and greater access to satellites. Uh, when it comes to satellites, I mean, the biggest advantage for the snipers in a regular platoon or company, I, I think, would be obviously the GPS systems. Uh, so they, it's easier to find your position is faster. Satellites also provide the sniper team with imagery to better prepare a sniper team for their mission. It also allows real-time intel to be passed from the front lines back to the commanders. In Iraq and Afghanistan, second-by-second second accurate information has played such a crucial role that a special system was developed for the advanced sniper, a system called MSIDS. 
MSID stands for uh, MAGTAS Secondary Imaging Dissemination System. It is a great asset to the sniper team uh, as well as the supported company or battalion. You can take uh, your camera with a multitude of lenses. You can go on tac chat and, and communicate via basically almost like an IM uh, or a text message uh, back to higher headquarters without ever having to get on a radio and actually physically talk. We don't have to report with you know pen and paper anymore. We can report using MSID, the cameras, uh, receiving information through that way, sending it back to higher, quicker turnaround, quicker you know analyzation of the battlefield for the commanders. The sniper or observer of the team will take pictures or video of what they're observing. That media is downloaded to a laptop and connected to their Prick 117 radio. The digital information is then transmitted via satellite. How are you getting this information back to me? I do have a, uh, a camera yeah. um, and MSIVs that I will be taking out. You're telling me you can digitally shoot it back to me early? Yes, sir. You're the first one that's, that's told me that capability. That's good. Another thing you're going to have to have is you're going to have to have a base station at the company. Wherever you're trying to send uh, that information, it's going to have to have an MSIDS uh, suite base station to receive that information. So now you have two dedicated radios and a dedicated channel along with all the gear on both ends before you can get anything operational. But in the end, when you have it up and working, it's the best asset that you can have out there. It actually brings the people that are sitting on the base, the rest of the Marines inside that uh, command center, it can bring their attention basically to the battlefield without them ever having to leave that COC. The development of the MSID system has helped to make the sniper more than a weapon. The advanced sniper is the eyes and ears of their commanders, who could be anywhere in the world. Given the ability and freedom of movement uh, with the satellite communication and way technology is going today, the opportunities for a scout sniper team operating in an area are endless. And utilizing that asset of satellite communication and your MSID suites, now we're afforded better communication and more up-to-date technology and information being passed than we ever had in the past. Coming up on Modern Sniper, the advanced sniping team uses demolition and close quarters combat tactics to clear urban heights. Whatever keeps you safe is the things that you got to think about. Nope, there's a blacked out window, I'm going to launch a rocket in it. The Army and Marines have developed several team leader courses to teach the tactics of the sniper team and the skills needed to be an advanced sniper. These courses must prepare the snipers for the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan. Locations where the snipers must remain unseen in urban hides that are often lived in by people who may or may not be hostile. The sniper team must be ready to enter a house, clear it of enemies, and keep it secure. To do this, the advanced sniper has borrowed tactics from police and SWAT to help win the urban battle. Having served as a, as a sworn police officer, I you know, had the occasion to work with uh, police snipers from different agencies. .75 up, last shot. From the outside looking in, was able to see how they're employed and uh, what, what their job is and how it relates to what we do. One shared tactic is the use of demolition. Our charges are built with hostages in mind. Collateral damage is a little looked at a little differently in the military than it is in, in law enforcement. Obviously, they don't want to kill innocent people or hurt innocent people. I mean, it's basically the same thing, but it's way, way reduced. In the team leader course, the advanced sniper team will learn what demolitions are available and how destructive they can be. As far as demolition goes, there's a multitude of things that you can bring with you. Primarily, it'd be C4 deck cord, time fuse, and igniter, along with your blasting caps, whether it be non-electrical or electrical. Uh, there's different ways you can go about setting up demolition. C4, uh, the deck cord itself, can be, can be used for uh, small charges. Uh, if you have to gain entry into uh, light skin doors, interior rooms, you can use that deck cord. The advanced sniper learns to go beyond the obvious uses for demolitions and identifies each member of the team and what they could use explosives for. A loophole is a small opening that the sniper uses to aim and fire through without being detected. If there is not already a loophole in the building, then the assistant team leader may create one with a string of deck cord coiled in a spiral. You can coordinate with other units have a distraction over here while you blow a small charge here to create a loophole for you to utilize instead of just 
staring out the window. Now you have to make them fight like you fight. They have to be a trained observer now, and they have to look for disturbances in the baseline instead of just, uh, oh, there's a blacked out window, I'm gonna launch a rocket in it. While the assistant team leader is preparing his loophole, the security element is using demolitions to protect the team. The team leader course teaches the snipers how to build protective explosives, but it is up to the security member of the team to decide how and when to use them. Some things that you need to think about though if you're using explosives is if you're in an occupied hide, uh, you, you gotta take that family safety into consideration as well. You're not there to cause you know, harm to anybody except the enemy. I, I always felt safer having the, the human aspect out there as my security, you know, rather than, you know, I'm gonna set up a, a claymore, a child walks into the house, or a grenade, a child comes in. Wherever you set that device, you're not just gonna set and leave it, you're gonna set it, and then you're gonna have a Marine watching that area. So if it is a combatant or uh, something like that, then, hey, he lets him walk into the device and then goes to town from there. The security may also choose to use demolitions to protect the team as they leave the hide. In my experience, you got people maneuvering on you. Something just happened. They know where people are, and they're not stupid. They know that that was a precision shot. They know there's somebody vital here. They don't know who it is, but they know it's somebody that needs to be eliminated. So a lot of times we would exit the building, go around the back of the building and place a charge on the wall. All these compounds in Iraq have huge walls around them. So we would maintain a, a, a covered position, maintain security put a charge on that wall and blow an exit route out the back of the wall using demolitions. That's something we did time and time again. Demolitions are often used to gain access to buildings the sniper teams need to occupy. We could use a donut charge that goes around the door handle and defeats the locking mechanism. We could utilize a slider charge that goes along the door hinges and defeats the door that way. Multiple breaching charges. A linear charge will defeat an interior door. All right, stand by. Fire and hole, fire and hole, fire and hole. Once they are in the door, each member of the team begins methodically clearing the building. This system of clearing and moving through the rooms is its own unique style of fighting known as CQB or close quarter battle. Everybody's an infantryman, so they have to know how to do it once for all. You can't just run into a building and say, okay, I'm taking over. You gotta know how to clear the points that you need to be cleared. Uh, you always wanna have the element of surprise because you don't want them to know you're coming. So basically you just, as soon as you make that first entry, you just go, 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 go. To make that first entry, the security member of the team will breach the door. Your rear guy will pop that door and you're first in. Yeah, either you're gonna be A, your team leader, or um, I chose myself. I was usually the second in that door because that way I could have direct control. If you start going in there and a machine gun opens up, you hear that rock and you can at least get him out and back. How fast the team clears the building depends on whether it is day or night. At night, the advanced sniper will use a soft clear in which they will move slowly and secretly from room to room. Soft clears are uh, what we generally focus on. You'd like to go in at night because obviously the element of surprise. Use whatever method we need to gain entry into the courtyard itself, whether it be bolt cutters or just jumping over the wall. Then you gain entry into the actual courtyard. In, in our case, we had two automatic riflemen, which were saw gunners and then you have another guy in the team that's gonna maintain security down on the bottom floor and take care of the family. Watch out, watch where you're walking, Jack. Take the door on the left, take the door on the left. Once you gain entry into the building, the other three man, the team leader, the ATL, or whoever the third man is, that OP team's going straight upstairs to do work and clear upstairs. You wanna be as quiet as possible, you know, checking for um, trip wires and, and, and traps and stuff like that. And, Make sure you're watching around so no one sees that you're going in there. And Utilizing your MVGs and your IR uh, floodlights, you're doing a soft clear of the room and making sure there's nothing booby trapped, nothing fishy. The family's taken care of, and like I said, the security team's taken care of downstairs, and the OP team's clearing everything on its way upstairs to set up their OP and conduct observation. While the sniper teams prefer nighttime operations, there are situations where they are forced to clear buildings during the day. Say you were on a patrol with a regular platoon or a regular squad and you ended up getting contact and the target was too far for the regular infantrymen to hit, so the snipers would have to run into the side of a building to get a better shot at them, um, work their way to the roof, or to a window or anything like that. 
So they'd have to be able to clear the room as fast as they're moving. Going in there to clear and you know it's hostile, you're not going to go in there slow. You're going to go in there and make sure you clear that building. You go in fast and you keep that pace. You know, obviously there's going to be obstacles and stuff. You just have to adapt as quick as you can. You own that room. You're in there. You secure that room. You're not hanging out. You're moving on to the next room. You go from room to room, stairway to stairway, and door to door, uh, closet to closet. It's just everything needs to be cleared before you try to set up your position. When the room is clear, when the area is secured, then it's saying, OK, Roger, now my security is in place. Let's start setting up our OP. After safely entering and clearing their urban hide, the advanced sniper team can begin their primary mission. They are watching, taking notes, and waiting for the opportunity to strike. Coming up on Modern Sniper. You're able to see out and nobody sees six Marines sitting on the hillside. The sniper has learned several new tricks to keep themselves safe. Wood fire support is not, it's just indiscriminately dropping ordnance. It's got to be used to shape that battlefield. As team leader courses in the Army and Marines focus on building up the size and skill set of the advanced sniper team, they must also begin to adapt their safety and survival methods to meet the demands of today's conflicts. The well-being of the advanced sniper depends on every member of the team, whether they are setting up camouflage, calling in fire support, or taking a shot. Each member's unique skill set offers solutions that help ensure their safety and survival. Once you've mastered the art of being able to blend in with your environment, then truly you understand the art of camouflage and that's exactly what it is, it's an art. What it all comes down to is hiding what will stick out to the enemy. The, the biggest target indicator on the human being is the head, neck, and shoulders area. It's the most identifiable features on a person from a distance. To effectively hide, the sniper will adjust his camouflage to match his surroundings. When they are in a building, that could be as simple as a sheet draped over his head and gun. The advanced sniper team does not stop their training at urban hides. They must be prepared to use a number of techniques that make them look like the jungle or the desert. To be an effective sniper, understanding camouflage and how it works and what can be seen and what can't be seen, that takes a great deal of time. Uh, to become proficient with and to understand. No matter what the terrain, snipers will help each other construct their camouflage. In a forest environment, the first line of defense is the ghillie suit. If the team is working in the desert, then their camo must match the sand around them. During uh, daylight operations, we utilized uh, chicken wire. Different techniques that I've used from using arctic over whites that I dye, uh, sheets that I dye, spray paint, and then put a spray adhesive, some talcy sand on it. And with that chicken wire, it's big enough for your team, so that way in the daytime, when the sun comes up, you lay that over your team, and now you are the rocks. With this technique, the snipers will assist each other in assembling and entering the hide. Teamwork is key in making sure that every part of the sniper is properly camouflaged. We need a big chunk of transplant right in front of uh, the main loophole. Roger, I got so it. Right on the right side as, as it comes up. Here's like That'll... three shadows right there. That'll complete the, the effect. And now, uh, through the chicken wire being crinkled and whatnot, you're able to see out and nobody sees uh, four Marines or six Marines sitting on a hillside. Of course, camouflage is not the only way to stay concealed from the enemy. Snipers in Afghanistan have learned that taking positions high in the mountains can be an ideal place to stay concealed while affording a commanding perspective on the battlefield. However, Taking a shot from a high angle position can be one of the greatest marksmanship challenges in sniping. That's something that if you've never done it before, that's a whole different breed of marksmanship is high angle shooting. If you've never done a high angle shoot before uh, and you step out there and you think it's going to be the same as shooting flat line distance, then you're sadly mistaken. There's a lot more variables that go into it because, I mean, you're looking up and whatever this is, it, it is what it is, but the bullet's only affected by gravity for this distance here. So this could be 600 yards, but whatever this angle is, you gotta think that angle is compensating for the horizontal distance. Snipers use the Pythagorean theorem to adjust the angle of the shot. They know the C side of a triangle is the distance from them to their target. 
They use this and the angle of their shot to figure out the distance of the B side of their triangle. They then subtract B squared from C squared to find A squared. The A distance is what they use to adjust their scope. What's that range? 750? At the team leaders course, the students engage several targets from the tower. The targets range from 150 yards away to right below them. Once again, teamwork makes the difference between success and failure. The observer uses a slope doper to find the angle of the shot. The sniper provides the observer with a mill reading of the target. One and a half. Using those two factors, he can calculate the horizontal distance to the target. That is given to the sniper and he engages that target. Obviously downtown Dallas has got a ton of height, so the potential is there to have really extreme angle shooting. Look, clear. Excellent. Great time. Good job. Freaking awesome. I would say it's reinforced what I know more than it wasn't that it was new. It was it was a reinforcement of, of what, what what I've been getting trained uh, to do. Not only do snipers have to consider the calculations of a high angle shot, but they also have to think about whether they should take the shot in the first place. Shooting their weapon will often give away their position. You want to go out there. Um, and gather the maximum amount of intelligence as possible. And if you're gonna pull that trigger, like I said before, it's a consequence that I've come from that. As a solution, the team leaders are being taught to call in fire support. Fire support often comes in the form of a plane, helicopter, or mortar, and even though it makes a larger impact, the location of the team remains secret and safe. What fire support is not is just indiscriminately dropping ordnance. Okay, it's got to be used to shape that battlefield. If you got a hundred troops down on the ground there, you're going to pull your trigger at night with a Barrett. You know, that's when I would either call for fire or whatever, because they don't know where that's coming from. Uh, they can pretty much triangulate where you're shooting from, and that round cracks off. Calling for fire is uh, looking at enemy targets that I can't take out with my sniper rifle, and I need heavier artillery or, or mortar fire. And I'm just giving them a direction and distance from my position and they're going to drop around. I'm going to adjust them on target, and target's neutralized. It gives you that option to stay on the battlefield longer and get more positive things done using your air vices, using your gun. It's really up to that team leader. That's, again, going back to the team leader. That's his job, to make that call on the ground. If the team leader decides to call in fire support, he must consider what's available to him, and on the modern battlefield, it doesn't necessarily come from the same branch of the military. Pretty much the first guys to show up, uh, the first guys to show up and, and, and help you guys out is, that's what you want. It doesn't matter whether it's from the Marine Corps or if it's a sister service, it does not matter uh, to that sniper team. FTC, FTC, this is Viper 1. Vehicle and troops in the open, fire when ready. Because of the joint effort, a sniper team leader will usually have a variety of assets available to him, from fixed-wing aircraft with bombs to Cobra helicopters with machine guns. And they almost always have mortars they can call in. Satellite communication has made cross-branch communication easier and more efficient, making calls for support fire a great tool for the sniper. Coming up on Modern Sniper, the final exercise of the team leader course. And they want to be able to demonstrate to us, you know, I can go out in combat and be successful. Killing those two guys is going to provide immediate security for y'all. There's three guys alone on the battlefield, and it's, it's pretty scary sometimes. Over eight weeks, students at the team leader course have been learning what it takes to be an advanced sniper. From fire support to close quarters combat, a good sniper team can take on any situation presented to them. And the best way to test what the snipers have learned is to give them a simulated mission and throw in unexpected obstacles. They're employing a lot of what they're going to do in combat here on the final exercise in a school environment. Hopefully they're successful and, and they get better in their abilities to move around undetected. During the 72-hour final exercise, Two teams of six snipers will formulate and execute a plan to observe an enemy stronghold. The exercise simulates that the intelligence they gather will be used to support a company that will be assaulting that same town. 
In the team's plans, one team will observe the town from the surrounding wood line, while the other team observes the same area from a nearby tower. The three objectives for the teams are to gather intelligence, support each other, and most importantly, to stay undetected. It seems like such a simple thing for four guys to be able to move to a pre-designated area in a tactical fashion, but by the time you add gear and you add the heat of the moment and excitement, everyone kind of follows their own instinct if you don't have it planned and you haven't rehearsed and rehearsed to the point. So, you know, I think the final exercises are very valuable for that reason. For the sniper team leader, the plan is everything. Our mission is no later than 1200, 14 September 2009, Viper Team 1. We'll depart Camp Geiger and move to grid 74304250. The first thing they're thinking about, having talked with many commanders about this subject in and of itself, is why do I want to put you out there? Give me your mission in a, in a, in a one, one sentence blurb. Insert, get eyes on the objective, get all my men back safely to the extract point, and give the commander as much information we can on the objective for his attack as possible. Why do I want to put you at risk and potentially risk having to send a QRF element out to rescue you. Um, there is thick vegetation in the area, so our movement to our position and to get eyes on the objective is gonna be slow. How much is it gonna slow you down? You're leaving today and you've gotta be back when? Tomorrow? I, as the commander, am going to think about when you get out there, if it's a huge impact, it keeps you from getting into position and accomplishing your mission. That's something I need to know. You have to convey to them, this is why you should put me out there. This is what I can do for you. This is how I can be successful. And uh, you explain that through your mission that you put together. You're the first one that's covered any of these. But this is the whole, this is the whole reason I'm sending you out there. While the brief is underway, the assistant team leader preps the rest of the team and their gear for the mission. Viper's Nest, Viper's Nest, this is Viper 1, radio check, over. Once the brief is complete and their gear is prepped, the two sniper teams begin their mission. Viper 1 will move into a tower to be the primary observer team. Viper 2 will move to the woods around the town to support Viper 1. Both teams must assume that the instructors are hunting them and, just like in a real battle, compromise is failure. As soon as we begin the field skills portion, you're always under observation. There's three guys alone on the battlefield, it's, it's pretty scary sometimes. You know, you sit there and you, you're hearing things and you're wondering, what's that, you know? You, you're pretty much on your P's and Q's a lot more than you would be if you were with a squad. You need to have a keen situational awareness to everything that's going on around you. And they want to be able to demonstrate to us proficiency that, hey, you know, I can go out in combat and be successful. After a successful insert, Viper 2 must establish communication with Viper 1. Viper 1, Viper 1, Viper 2. This is where Viper 2 runs into their first obstacle. Their radio is not working and they cannot communicate with Viper 1. There is no way to know if Viper 1 has made it to the tower and if they are safe to continue to their rally point. Viper Ness, Viper Ness is Viper 2. Radio check over. The instructors, acting as enemy insurgents, begin to close in on Viper 2. Without having any prior knowledge of the team's whereabouts, their goal is to find and compromise the teams. And since they know exactly how a sniper thinks, they are Viper 2's biggest threat. They're going out there hunting these teams and pursuing these teams. They have no idea where they are but they're looking, they're, they're having to look for positions that they would select as a sniper. And it's at those times that they're interdicting the teams. In combat, if there is known insurgent activity in an area, the commanders will notify their forward teams. But when communication is out, the team is on their own. Since Viper 2's communication is down, they continue to move slowly and carefully to their rally point, stopping occasionally to try to communicate with Viper 1 but there is still no response. They don't know what lies ahead of them and have no idea of what is moving behind them. As they near their rally point, the lost communication has become a matter of life and death for Viper 2. The team leader makes the decision to stop 
and set up security until calm is fixed. But it is too late. The instructors have found them. It is only through the entire team working as one that they are able to repel the attack. The team kills an insurgent while the other one flees. By successfully defending themselves during the attack, they have passed a portion of the final exercise. Now, the instructors give the team a reality check. Which way your threat just come from, Bandu? That way, maybe you want to keep security up? Oh, he's got it. How far away are our enemy reinforcements? Closer than your QRF, right? So what should be your first concern? Now that they just know, they've been alerted to your presence. Get some distance between your five-man team and that enemy company size element, right? So what are you on the hook doing? Calling in your contact report, calling in QRF, telling them you need immediate extract. Only critique points are, hey, eliminate that threat first, okay? Whether it's two guys, whether it's five guys, whether it's 10 guys, if you can, if you can, if you can drop those dudes, drop them. Killing those two guys is gonna provide immediate security for y'all. So let's drop those guys. Even if there is a platoon size patrol 200 meters behind them, we drop those two guys, then we utilize that 30 second gap to ruck up and get out of there. You guys were ready to go in probably 20, 30 seconds. Do you see the benefit of staying prepared, of staying vigilant, staying ready? I think from what we've seen, you guys are, are ahead of your peer group, at least for the class. So kind of feel good about that, all right? All right, cool guys, bounce into the tree line, take five. After moving back into the woods, Viper 2 has restored communications. Yeah, could you send up a pause rep to a Viper's nest for us? Viper 1 has successfully made it to the tower. They are informed by the sniper control center that the target they have been watching is a terrorist commander. They must eliminate him, then exit the tower as rapidly as possible. Every second counts. The longer they remain in the tower, the more vulnerable they are to a much larger enemy force that's certain to be approaching. In order to be successful, Viper 1 must be ready to move as soon as they fire. Dispatch QRF at this time, I've got it. The RTO has called in a quick reaction force to extract them. Once they fire, their position will be compromised. The enemy will attack, and they must make it down four flights of stairs, providing seamless cover fire. Alright guys, go ahead and load the grade. On target. On target. Step out. TNT. Five, four, three. Come on, go, 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 go! Be advised, we have engaged two hostiles, two in the KIA at this time. The security fires cover fire out of a window, while the team leader and ATL move past them to the level below. Once the team leader and ATL reach that level, they now provide cover fire for security, who follows but moves past descending to the next level below to continuously provide seamless cover with an almost leapfrog-like effect. The team works together to make their way to the bottom floor of the tower. From here, they transition to their sidearms and make their way to the waiting Humvee. As they safely ride away from town, they know their mission is a success. They adapted to the situation and took out the enemy leader. In addition, Viper 2 is still out there, observing and reporting, and able to support the company assault that will begin in a few hours. They are advanced sniper teams, ready for the next mission. When it comes to snipers, we'll always be the ones leading from the front, and we will always be there. As a sniper team, you have the best eyes on the battlefield nine times out of ten. The need for snipers is always going to be there because you can get these cameras and you can get all these high-speed gear, but you still have to have those eyes forward, and the snipers are the only ones that are going to be able to do it. The advanced sniper team, whether Army, Coast Guard, Navy, or Marines, is an incredible force on the battlefield. Through their tactics and techniques, weapons and demolitions, the advanced sniper team is changing the way modern warfare is fought. The understanding of how to employ demolitions, it's not covered in the basic course, it is covered here. What makes the advanced sniper unique is their understanding of the sniper team and how to lead it. 
the most important thing is the ability to lead a mission, be able to tactically decide, communicate, and execute a mission to uh, the fullest. It's fundamental here because as a team leader and uh, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, that's what you're going to be doing. He is no longer a lone warrior tasked with a single shot. He is part of a team whose skill sets and tactics are so varied and advanced that they can alter the landscape of the battlefield. The sniper team did not come from any particular service. It is a shared tactic that has been adapted to suit the needs of the modern sniper. And although each different branch of the military trains at separate facilities with varying courses, they must ultimately work together seamlessly to accomplish the overall mission. You'll have air support from Marines, you'll have EOD support from the Navy, you'll have Army support for your QRF, so just a big joint operation. Working with the other branches, it helps you you know, get everyone's different views on sniper missions and different ways to do things. I think every service, they, they pretty much do about the same things. Just some might shoot a little bit better than others, some might be better attacked. Few weapons on the 21st century battlefield are as effective as the modern sniper. On any battlefield, a proficient sniper has got the capability to change the tide of that battle. Now fielded by every branch of the U.S. Armed Forces, from the Army to the Marines, Coast Guard, and Navy, these elite warriors continue to prove their value in modern conflicts. No shot is the same shot, so you have to be prepared for every shot. This four-part series looks at how the role of the sniper, their tactics and technology, are changing to effectively combat everything from insurgents to smugglers and tribal warlords. You can't just stamp out a sniper. These professionals are highly trained, infinitely adaptable, and frighteningly lethal. They are today's modern sniper. I'm Saul Parker. I'm the team leader of Sniper Team 1, Viper 1. I'm going to go ahead and orient you guys this morning for our mission. The final exercise of the Sniper Team Leader course demonstrates the improved skills and tactics of the advanced modern sniper. I'm with 1 6, and I'm tasked with uh, bringing stability back to the, the area. Give me your mission in a, in a, in a one, one sentence blurb. Insert, get eyes on the objective. Get all my men back safely to the extract point. Without immediate supervision from anybody. The first job of the team leader is to assemble snipers with various weapons and capabilities to support him. Flash out. The first position to be filled is the assistant team leader. Your ATL, your assistant team leader, he's, his main responsibility is going to be the uh, strong arm of the team. He's going to be ensuring that Team training is always being conducted when you're back in the rear and when you're in country that uh, the state readiness of the team is always high. All right, from here, I can go off the small of his back. The assistant team leader usually carries another long-range weapon, but his weapon is meant for rapid, closer engagements. He is a defensive weapon who will defend his team from multiple enemies at varying distances. With the team leader, the ATL helps to assign the other positions on the sniper team. It's all about experience and who's fit for the job and who's going to increase survivability for the team when they're out on the battlefield. The third and fourth members of the team account for what's possibly the most vital element to its survival and safety, security. The security is preferably a two-man element carrying tremendous firepower. The best tool for the security is a fully automatic weapon capable of repelling a full-scale close-in attack. Uh, when it comes to security element, the security element will end up overwatching the areas that you can't watch because you're observing. It could be uh, to wherever the main... And give the commander as much information we can on the objective for his attack as possible. The advanced sniper has grown from the two-man team with a single objective to a six-man element capable of taking on increasingly complex missions. The insurgents did occupy in that area. Took over the locals, harassing the locals with uh, small arms fire, improvised explosive devices. They've been attacking the police stations. In addition to increased team numbers, what separates the advanced sniper is his expert camouflage capability, 
the ability to call in close air support, and most importantly, his ability to think on his feet. You gotta be an adaptive, intuitive thinker. And with a growing demand for sniper teams, the Army, Marines, Navy, and even police snipers have come together to take a course that over the next eight weeks will teach them the combat capabilities and explosive power of the advanced sniper team. A sniper team leader needs to be well versed, not just in marksmanship or even observation, but in other areas that you know, are gonna allow him to be able to do his job better. Take a knee, belay out, engage targets. They're gaining the knowledge on how to engage targets at an angle. The calculations that go into that. The other thing they're, they're taking away from this is the... It's been the others. This sharing of information between services has helped to create the advanced sniper. They are part of a team. Each member of that team brings unique skills that make the sniper more effective. How a sniper team is formed is dependent on that branch of the military. For the Coast Guard, a sniper team is a gunner, a pilot, and a co-pilot. For the Marines, a sniper team can be a six-man unit. And for the Army, a sniper team may only be three soldiers taking on a particular mission. There are three basic positions of the advanced sniper team. The team leader is most often the primary sniper of the team. He is carrying the long-range bolt-action rifle capable of hitting a high-value target past 1,000 yards. We're here, Camp Geiger. We're going to uh, depart Camp Geiger with Team 1, Viper 1. Not necessarily the guy always pulling the trigger. Uh, anyone in the team could be up actually observing in country and be the one to have to initiate an ambush or engage a threat. But your team leader is going to be the most seasoned guy on the team, not necessarily senior in rank, but most experienced in the team. He's going out with his team all the time. When his team is on the ground, he's there. It's his responsibility. He's the one calling the shots out there. When we go out there, it's going to be me and four other guys. And we're going to be, you know, operating in that area and doing whatever we have to do. 